It's on the heels of the proposed Wilmot Proviso that we have the election of 1848. And the Whigs follow the strategy that only, the only winning strategy the Whigs had ever used, and that was to nominate a famous general. It had worked with William Henry Harrison. They try again with Zachary Taylor. And Zachary Taylor comes out with no official stance on slavery and the expansion of slavery. The Democrats nominate a politician by the name of Lewis Cass, who was really championing uh, an emerging idea known as popular sovereignty. Now, popular sovereignty, sometimes called squatter sovereignty, said that in new territories, don't have Congress make the decision, don't have the president make the decision, don't go off old decisions like the Missouri Compromise, allow the settlers in that territory to decide whether they want their land to be slave or free. And this sounds great to a lot of people in Congress because it avoids them having to take a controversial position on the controversial issue. It lets somebody else do the hard work. The Free Soil Party is also going to play a role in the election of 1848. They nominate Martin Van Buren, former presidential, uh, former president, former presidential candidate of the Democrats. And Van Buren, outspoken critic of slavery, steals votes from those Northern Democrats who may have voted for Lewis Cass. For some Northern Democrats, the idea of slavery spreading is abhorrent, is awful. And they jump on board with the Free Soil Party, which was championing the idea of stopping the spread of slavery. No slavery in new territory. And so some of those Northern Democrats who didn't like the idea of popular sovereignty allowing slavery to spread to the West vote for Van Buren. It's enough to help Taylor win. In the meantime, gold is discovered in California, near Sutter's Mill in 1848. This is just outside San Francisco. And almost immediately, we have a population boom in and around San Francisco. This is part of the reason why the San Francisco for, uh, football team is known as the 49ers, because so many people moved to that area in 1849. And remember, this isn't nice, uh, church-going uh, Bible reading families moving to California. This is mostly single men, sometimes with a not necessarily law abiding past, sometimes willing to do unscrupulous things to grab the most valuable claim of land. California is struggling with this rapid influx of people. President Taylor wants to try to fast track California into the country to provide some law and order for this uh, rough and tumble territory. But he wants to fast track it into the nation as a free state. This action, this proposal of quickly admitting California to the country as a free state unifies the South. They feel like it's an attempt to block slavery in new territories and the South is unified against it. So how are we going to get California into the Union? That's how we get to the Compromise of 1850. Congress tries to create a compromise to bring California into the Union. And it's led in his last major political effort by the Whig leader Henry Clay, the great compromiser, his compa uh, compatriot in the Whigs, Daniel Webster, and their ally on many issues, John C. Calhoun, himself also a Whig by this point. Calhoun was so old and infirmed by this time that he had to be brought into the Senate chambers in a uh, hospital bed, and he would write out his statements, and the junior senator, the other senator from South Carolina, would actually read them for him. So here's what Clay, Webster, and Calhoun are proposing. California will be admitted to the Union as a free state. And the rest of the Mexican session, the Utah Territory, the New Mexico Territory, that will be determined by popular sovereignty. Texas is going to be slave, but the rest of the Mexican session will be determined by popular sovereignty. Many Northerners were okay with this idea because the arid climate in this region, the lack of rainfall, meant that it was probably not going to be good for cotton farming anyway. And the, re the threat of slavery spreading to the deserts of New Mexico was not very realistic. 
It will also end the slave trade in Washington, D.C. As other wor um, worldly powers ban slavery, it's really becoming an embarrassment for many Northerners when foreign dignitaries travel to our country and go to our capital and see slaves, see people being sold in slave auctions and slave markets right there in Washington, D.C. Remember, D.C. is in between Maryland and Virginia, both slave states. So the slave trade was um, was rather vibrant in that area. Northerners don't want it in the capital, though. So what are Southerners going to get in the Compromise of 1850? Southerners would get a new, more strict fugitive slave law. I'll go over some of the details more in a moment. But the Compromise of 1850 initially fails because Clay and Webster and Calhoun tried to push it through as an omnibus bill. All of these provisions included in one bill. And enough people in Congress can see one or two things in that proposed omnibus bill that they don't like and therefore vote no on the whole thing. Stephen Douglas, an emerging important name in the Senate from Illinois, is able to successfully shepherd the Compromise of 1850 through the legislative process and get all of those provisions passed as separate bills. He uses some log rolling techniques. He makes some compromises, makes some deals, but all of those provisions we just went over are passed by Congress and signed by the president. Most important is that fugitive slave law, which says that fugitive slaves or accused runaway slaves will not be given a trial by jury. They will simply be brought before a judge. And the accused runaway slave was not allowed to testify. What this means is the new fugitive slave law really opens up the possibility of free African Americans being kidnapped into slavery. The part, however, that probably made most white people in the North upset is the fact that Northerners had to cooperate with slave catchers. Northern law enforcement, um, police officers and sheriffs have to help slave catchers catch accused runaway slaves in their area. In other words, Northern tax dollars are going to support the institution of slavery. Many Northerners are not okay with this. In fact, both sides are upset with the fugitive slave law. Abolitionists and others in the North hate the parts we've just talked about. And Southerners feel that Northerners are breaking the law, are not following it, that Northern law officers are not helping as much as they should, and that Northern citizens are actually helping hide slaves rather than comply with the new law. 